question that I always get is, uh oh, I just noticed that one of the shots from my indie film, there's a big brand logo that's probably protected by trademark, right? Or I just noticed that on a TV in the background in my film, there's a clip from a copyrighted film or TV show. Is this a concern? Do I have to re-edit my film or do I have to even reshoot those shots in order to make sure that I don't get you know, crushed with litigation? I'll start by saying that ideally it's best to get a written release for any trademarked or copyrighted material that might appear in your film with the usual clauses. That is, you have a license to use the trademark or the copyrighted image or the clip uh, in perpetuity, throughout the universe, in any and all media, and so forth. Uh, however, there are situations where getting that kind of release just isn't realistic. Uh, it wouldn't be realistic to expect you to get a release from Nike just because you happen to see a character's feet in a brief shot from your film and they happen to be wearing Nike sneakers. It wouldn't be realistic to require you to get a release from Ford Motor Company just because you can see a Ford Explorer in a parking lot shot in your film that lasts for about five seconds. If you had to do that, then it, it would just become prohibitively expensive, right? Uh, thankfully, in these two examples, it's probably not legally necessary. But in some circumstances, you do need a release, and it's important to understand when that's going to be. So how do you tell when you absolutely need a release for copyrighted or trademarked material? and when you don't need to worry about it. So let's start with the usual disclaimers. Uh, number one, this is not legal advice. Uh, if I wanted to give you legal advice, I would have to understand your specific situation and your specific needs. And right now I'm just a lawyer talking to you on the internet. Uh, number two, I'm gonna be talking about issues of US law primarily. So if you made your film outside the United States, or if you're gonna distribute it outside the United States, then the content of this video may not apply to you. Uh, also, if you appreciated this content, if you learned something from it, I'd really like it if you could like this video and you could subscribe uh, to make sure that I can keep providing this kind of educational content to enterprising young filmmakers such as yourself. Now, let's get on with it. Uh, like I said, there are basically two intellectual property concepts at play here, which are trademark and copyright. Uh, I'll take each of these one by one. I think that trademark presents less complex issues here, so I'm going to talk about that first. Uh, first of all, what is a trademark? It's a symbol or a word or a series of words that the trademark holder has the exclusive right to use in representing their product or their service. So for instance, Nike holds a trademark in the whoosh symbol that appears on their shoes. Uh, McDonald's holds a trademark in the golden arches that make up the M in its logo. Apple computer holds a trademark in the phrase think different uh, in the context of its products. What is trademark infringement? That happens when someone uses the trademark in a way that creates what's called a likelihood of confusion. What is a likelihood of confusion? It means that the average person seeing the use of the trademark would believe that the person who's using the trademark had some kind of association or some kind of relationship with the trademark owner. The sort of paradigm example of this would be somebody producing knockoff Gucci handbags. Uh, with either a Gucci logo or a Gucci-like logo on them. Like let's say that they changed the U to an A, so it said Gachi, but they would hope that the consumer wasn't going to see that and they would buy the handbag thinking that it was Gucci. Uh, that infringes Gucci's trademark because your average consumer would look at one of these handbags and think that it was associated with Gucci when in fact it was simply a knockoff. So in that case, trademark law is being used to protect Gucci from somebody profiting off of their name. But uh, a movie or a TV show usually doesn't present the same type of situation. Uh, if you watched a movie and there was a shot where, like we were talking about before, somebody walks down the street wearing Nike sneakers, you wouldn't immediately jump to the conclusion that therefore the filmmaker had some kind of association with Nike, right? You wouldn't think that Nike paid for the movie or that they made the movie or something of that nature. You would figure, well, you know, Nike shoes are a relatively common product, so you would just naturally expect somebody to be walking down the street wearing them. So that's why you usually don't have to worry about a trademark logo or word or phrase appearing in your film, because no reasonable person watching your film would think that because you had the trademarked thing in your film, therefore you had some kind of association with the trademark owner. In other words, there would be no likelihood of confusion. Let's talk about an example from case law. Some of you might remember the ridiculous song Barbie Girl from the late 90s, which was recorded by the Danish band Aqua and released on MCA Records. Mattel, the maker of the Barbie doll, didn't like the unwholesome portrayal of Barbie in the song and music video for Barbie Girl, and so they sued MCA Records for trademark infringement, uh, specifically infringement of Mattel's trademark in the word Barbie. The court did not allow the suit to go to trial. The court reasoned that there was no way that a reasonable person could think that Mattel was responsible for that song. The song makes fun, in a fairly off-color way, of the Barbie doll, after all, and no one would think that Mattel would release such a song, so there was no likelihood of confusion. 
Now, here's another case where a film's use of a trademark might be seen as more troublesome. Uh, in the early 2000s, David Spade starred in a movie called Dickie Roberts, Former Child Star. Ah, the days when Saturday Night Live was funny, so we were bombarded with a slew of feature-length versions of SNL sketches. Anyway, in the film, Spade's character tries to slide on a slip and slide, which is basically a strip of yellow plastic that you can slide on when it's wet. But he forgets to wet the slide, so his back gets all chafed. And you can see the slip and slide logo in the movie during the scene. It's very obvious that they're using the product. Now, a company called Whammo, which makes the slip and slide, sued Paramount Pictures, which distributed the Dickie Roberts film, for a trademark infringement. Even though Spade very explicitly used the slip and slide toy in the film, and a not particularly observant person might think that the film was meant to imply that the slip and slide is dangerous, even though David Spade obviously misuses it in the movie, the court ruled against Whammo. Uh, the court, like in the Barbie case, reasoned that the use of the slip and slide logo in the film didn't create a likelihood of confusion because no one would watch the movie and think that Whammo had anything to do with this ridiculous film. So hopefully that was a good summary of this likelihood of confusion concept. And hopefully this helps you understand why your use of a trademark logo or brand name in your film is not likely to create a likelihood of confusion. Now, the use of copyrighted materials in a film uh, presents a more difficult issue for filmmakers. Uh, just so it's clear, what I'm talking about is an actual use of a photo or a video clip in your film, or what's known as direct copying. That is, it actually appears on the screen. Uh, I'm not talking about a situation in which someone claims that you copied story elements or characters or dialogue from their script or their treatment. Uh, that would usually be phrased in terms of your script being, quote unquote, substantially similar to the pre-existing script or movie or treatment. Uh, I talk about that issue in another video on this channel, though, if you're interested. Compared to trademark infringement, a copyright owner doesn't have to do very much to show that you infringe their copyright. They only have to prove that they own and they've registered a copyright in the creative work in question. That is the photo or the TV or movie clip or something else. Uh, and they have to show that you copied their work in a way that does not amount to fair use. Uh, more on what fair use means later. Also, the copyright owner doesn't have to show that your use of the clip or the video caused them any kind of financial loss. Uh, in other words, that the market value of the movie or the TV show or the news broadcast or whatever it was that you got the clip or the photo from went down. Uh, they can also recover whatever profits you may have gained by using their copyrighted work. And even if they can't provide evidence that they suffered a financial loss or that you made a profit, they can still get what are called statutory damages. Um, that, generally speaking, means an award of between seven hundred and fifty and thirty thousand dollars, depending on what the court considers just, quote unquote. So it leaves a lot up to the judge's discretion. Uh, what's more, the copyright owner can ask that you be ordered to pay what's called their attorney's fees. In other words, the fees that they pay for taking you to court for copyright infringement. And again, the judge has discretion to award those types of fees in a copyright infringement case. So I would say, broadly speaking, that the use of copyrighted materials in your film presents more of a risk to you than trademark materials. Uh, and it's more important to make sure where it's possible that you have a release for any copyrighted materials that are directly copied, like I said before, in your film. If you don't have a release for a photo or a video clip that you use in your film, ideally you want to make sure that your use of the image or the clip is protected by the fair use doctrine. Uh, I promised in an earlier video that I would get into more detail about what the fair use doctrine is, and I'm going to do that right now. But generally speaking, what is the purpose of the fair use doctrine? The idea is to make sure that even though people can protect their creative works with copyright law, a copyright doesn't end up prohibiting people from critiquing or analyzing a creative work or citing it to make academic, political, or social commentary. Uh, for example, if there were no fair use doctrine, theoretically, a studio that distributed a movie could use the copyright laws to prevent a critic from writing a negative review of their film. They could say, hey, in your review, you quoted copyrighted dialogue from our film, or you used a copyrighted still from our film at the beginning of your article, and you have to remove the article now. It could prohibit a professor from publishing an article that was critical of a film or that simply quoted a film for the purposes of discussion, and so on. So to avoid a situation where copyright law destroys freedom of speech, Congress and the courts have both adopted this fair use doctrine under which a person using copyrighted materials can argue that, well, even if what I did would ordinarily be considered copyright infringement, uh, I'm allowed to do that in this situation because it's fair use. The courts consider four factors in determining whether the use of a particular image or clip is fair use. 
Uh, these are, one, the purpose and character of the use, including whether such use is of a commercial nature or is for nonprofit educational purposes. Two, the nature of the copyrighted work. Three, the amount and substantiality of the portion used in relation to the copyrighted work as a whole. And four, the effect of the use upon the potential market for or value of the copyrighted work. A court has a lot of discretion in deciding whether the use of a particular clip or image amounts to fair use. They have to consider the factors I just described, but as long as they do that, the decision as to whether the fair use defense applies is really up to each individual judge, and it's hard to say how a judge is going to rule in any individual case. This is one of the reasons why an errors and omissions insurer may require you to pay a higher premium if you're looking to include a lot of copyrighted clips or stills in your film and you want to claim that those are protected by the fair use doctrine. In other words, relying on the fair use doctrine always presents some kind of a risk, and insurance premiums sometimes are going to be adjusted to account for that. So that's something that you should remember. So what does each of these four fair use factors mean? Let's start with the purpose and character of the use. For this to work in your favor, you want the use of the image or the clip in your film to be what's called transformative. Uh, what does it mean for the use to be transformative? The Supreme Court has said that it means you give a new expression, meaning, or message to the photo or the clip. A parody of a movie or a song or a criticism of a creative work are common examples of this. Uh, probably the concept can be best explained by talking about a couple of legal cases. In one case, LA News Service, a news gathering organization, filmed a clip of some violence that happened during the 1992 LA riots. A court TV, the legal TV channel that used to be around, used LA News Service's clip in a montage sequence about the trial of one of the rioters with a ticking orange clock superimposed over it. The court found that Court TV's use of the clip was transformative in the sense that rather than simply playing the clip, Court TV included it in a montage with other video clips from the riots and added its own artwork to the montage, thus adding an element of creativity that wasn't originally present in the clip. And that's a pretty borderline case, really. I mean, Court TV wasn't parodying the clip, and it wasn't criticizing the camera work that was used in the clip or, or something of that nature. So it wasn't what you would think of as an obvious or paradigmatic case of transformative use. And yet, the court still ruled in Court TV's favor. Now let's contrast that with an earlier case that was decided by the same court, that is the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, in which Reuters News Service copied the same clip of the L.A. riots that was later used by Court TV. But the difference was that Reuters didn't incorporate the clip into a montage or add any kind of artwork or animation. Instead, it just sent the whole clip to multiple international news organizations. That was the copying that was being objected to by the plaintiff. The Ninth Circuit Court ruled that because Reuters didn't add any creative elements to the clip, Reuters' use of the clip was not transformative, which was one big reason why Reuters showing the clip didn't qualify as fair use. Uh, importantly, the mere fact that the clip was newsworthy, that is, that the LA riots were a matter of public interest, didn't mean that Reuters' copying of the clip was transformative. Another issue that courts take into account when looking at the purpose and character of the use is whether the use of the clip or the video was commercial, that is, whether the, the copyright infringer or the alleged copyright infringer made a profit from using it. Uh, probably your use of a photo or a video clip in your indie film is going to be commercial, because your whole intention, or at least one thing that you want to do, presumably in making your movie, is to have it distributed in theaters and put it on Netflix and Hulu and make a whole bunch of money. That doesn't totally sink your ability to rely on this fair use doctrine, but it is something to keep in mind. Factor number two, the nature of the copyrighted work. Uh, the courts consider creative works, that is narrative films and novels and songs and so on, to be at the core of what the Copyright Act is supposed to protect. So if the video clip or the photo you use in your film is a creative work, like what I just described, that's less likely to be considered fair use. If it's a clip from another movie, like if it's a clip from Pee Wee's Big Adventure where you know Pee Wee says, I'm trying to use the phone or something like that, the nature of the copyrighted work factor is going to work against you because we're talking about a work of fiction. On the other hand, if it's a clip showing a matter of fact, like a clip from a news broadcast, for instance, your use of that clip is more likely to be considered protected by the fair use doctrine. So if it's a news clip like the LA riots one I was talking about before, uh, that makes fair use protection more likely. Number three, the amount and substantiality of the portion used in relation to the copyrighted work as a whole. That's a big mouthful of words, but the meaning of them is relatively simple. Uh, the question that this factor asks is, for how much time does the copyrighted clip or photo appear in your film? 
And it's not just the length of time that you show the copyrighted material for, it's the length of time relative to the length of your film. In other words, if you made a short film that was only five minutes long and you showed a 30 second NBC news clip in it, that would be a large portion of the film and less likely to be protected by the fair use doctrine as a result. But if you showed the same 30 second NBC news clip in the context of a 90 minute feature film, then because it took up less of the film, you would be more likely to be protected by the fair use doctrine. Now, we can illustrate this with a case involving the cartoon show Family Guy. Back in 2006, an episode of Family Guy contained an 18 second clip of a character that obviously resembled a role the comedian Carol Burnett uh, used to play on her show called The Char Woman and playing a tune that sounded like the theme music from Carol Burnett's TV show. Uh, Burnett sued 20th Century Fox, which distributed Family Guy, for copyright infringement, and 20th Century Fox responded that the Family Guy clip was fair use. One important fact here was that Family Guy's use of the likeness of Carol Burnett was transformative, in the sense that Family Guy was parodying Burnett and her show, instead of just playing a clip from her show without any modification or, or commentary. But another important reason was that the clip was just 18 seconds long, which was a short period of time relative to the full length of the TV show episode. The court ruled based on these and the other two fair use factors that this Family Guy scene was fair use. Four, effect on the potential market for the copyrighted work. In other words, if we're talking about a film, for instance, would the appearance of the copyrighted material in the film cause fewer people to pay to see the copyrighted work? Uh, the underlying question is by using the copyrighted material, are you likely to cause the copyright owner to make less money? Uh, in my view, in most cases, the use of a copyrighted photo or clip in your film is not likely to cause a big financial loss to the copyright owner. Uh, if you used, for instance, a 15 second news clip from ABC News in your film, would that cause people to watch less ABC News? Probably not. They wouldn't be saying, well, if I've seen a 15 second clip from ABC News in this film, I've seen them all, right? Why watch any more news? Yeah, that wouldn't be the average person's way of thinking. Let's say that a character in your movie has a print of a Robert Mapplethorpe photo on the wall of their apartment. Is that going to cause people not to buy coffee table books with Mapplethorpe photos in them? No, probably not. Uh, and a court, in a case I'll talk about now, made the same type of ruling. In 2010, there was an indie film, Catfish, that was the darling of Sundance that year. The filmmakers played a 41 second clip from a song by a singer named Amy Cooney in the background of a scene, and they didn't get permission from the record company to do that. The record company sued the film's production company for copyright infringement, and the production company responded that the film's use of the song was fair use. In analyzing the effect of the movie's use of the song on the potential market for the song, that is the fourth fair use factor we've been talking about, the court said that no one who would otherwise have bought Amy Cooney's song or her album would have been deterred from doing that by the fact that you can hear a clip from it in the movie Catfish. And this was true, even though a 41 second clip is a pretty long excerpt from a pop song. So those are the four fair use factors in a nutshell. Uh, if you're planning to use a copyrighted image or a clip in your movie, I would definitely consider those factors carefully if you don't have a release, ideally with the help of a lawyer. So I hope this was helpful to you in understanding the situations where you need a release uh, to show a trademarked or copyrighted image or clip in your film. Thank you very much for watching.